Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. We have a tight schedule, so we're going to start just on time. Uh, I'm Janet Gornick. I'm the director of LIS, both the parent organization in Luxembourg and also our satellite office here uh, at the Graduate Center, which is known as the LIS Center. LIS is a cross-national data archive and research center. Our main office is in Luxembourg, in the country of Luxembourg. Um, and we have an active and expanding satellite office here at the Graduate Center, which is known as the LIS Center. The Graduate Center, as I think most of you know, is the doctoral granting campus of the City University of New York, and its focus on graduate training and its commitment to engaging in contemporary public um, dialogue makes it really an absolutely perfect home uh, for the LIS Center. LIS's core mission is to enable, facilitate, and promote cross-national comparative research. To accomplish that, we gather data sets from many countries, now nearly 50, and we harmonize them into a common template and make them available to researchers and policymakers around the world. Our claim to fame is that we make available microdata, which is data available at the person and household level, and that capacity makes us nearly unique in the world. Since LIS's founding in the early 1980s, nearly 5,000 researchers have used our data to study a range of socioeconomic outcomes and to identify and assess uh, institutions and policies that shape those outcomes. So that's what LIS does. You'll learn a lot more, I think, as the evening goes on. Um, at LIS, of course, uh, we're able to carry out our work only because of the tremendous support and sponsorship of many persons and organizations, so let me just mention uh, a few of them. I definitely want to acknowledge um, the Graduate Center, the Graduate Center leadership, especially Interim President Chase Robinson and also Interim Provost Louise Lenahan. They've provided LIS really with invaluable material support and moral support, uh, and Louise is here and she'll speak a little bit uh, as soon as I'm done. Chase, will he was called away to a meeting, and he'll join us uh, for the reception. I want to thank the Advanced Research Collaborative, which Louise will also say a little bit about. That's known as ARC, uh, and that's a new initiative here at the Graduate Center, and they've provided a tremendous amount of support for LIS, uh, for which we're grateful, and they sponsored this evening's event. We are extremely grateful to LIS's many financial sponsors, who are too numerous to mention, although, of course, not numerous enough. Um, <laughs> tonight, we really want to acknowledge, though, Luxembourg's uh, National Research Fund, which is essentially the National Science Foundation of Luxembourg, because they provided us with two grants that uh, funded the book. Uh, we definitely thank Stanford University Press, which has been an absolute delight uh, to work with. And I'm happy to recognize Paula England, who is the co-editor of the press, and she's with us um, this evening. I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't thank the LIST staff, both in Luxembourg and in New York City. The Luxembourg team, I hope, is watching the live streaming, even though it's definitely past what should be their bedtimes, and uh, most of the Graduate Center team is here um, tonight. So let me point to three key staff members I hope you'll have a chance to meet during the reception. Thierry Cloutin is here, and he is, uh, oversees our Luxembourg office. He's come from Luxembourg. Uh, he oversees the office in general, and specifically our complex IT system. Caroline Batzdorf is here, my partner in running the LIST Center here at the Graduate Center, and Berglin Ragnar's daughter is here. And she did a lot of the work behind the scenes to, uh, to organize this evening. And finally, of course, I want to recognize Tony Atkinson, who is the president of LIS's international governing body. And having Tony at the helm of our little ship has incalculable effects on the quality of the work that we do. He sends his regards, by the way. Two exciting developments have unfolded in recent months, and it's my pleasure to announce them both. Uh, the first is that Branko Milanovic, who is here to my left, widely recognized scholar of global inequality, has agreed after many years at the World Bank to join us here at the Graduate Center. He will arrive in January when he will take up the position of visiting presidential professor and senior scholar in the LIST Center. And tonight is his uh, inaugural event with us here at the Graduate Center. And we really could not be more delighted. Yay. Absolutely. The second, equally exciting, is that the LIST Center has just formed something called a Director's Council, an external body that will advise and help us as we seek to extend our resources. Tonight also marks the official launch of this council. Um, Tom Riley, who is here with us tonight, he's from the law firm Herbert Smith Freehills, has very generously agreed to chair this new council, and in a few minutes he'll make just a few remarks, and he will introduce you to the other first uh, four members of this important council. So Tom, we thank you already, and we look forward to a long and eventful relationship over the next few years. Okay, that said, 
Um, tonight's event, the meat, is, of course, the meat of the event is, of course, the panel itself. Um, the panel will be opened by Marcus Yanti, sitting here to my left, the book's other co-editor. When Marcus is not serving as an economics professor at Stockholm University, he is toiling as Lissa's research director, and he has kindly flown here from the People's Republic of Sweden to be with us um, this evening. And the panel will be closed by Branko Milanovic, who has kindly flown here from the People's Republic of the World Bank um, to join us uh, in advance of his real arrival in January. Between Marcus's opening comments and Branko's concluding remarks, you'll hear from the contributing authors. So I'm going to mention their names uh, quickly now. Art Alderson from Indiana University, um, Louis Chauvel from the University of Luxembourg, Vince Mahler from Loyola University in Chicago, my co-author Nancy Fulbray from the University of Massachusetts, Bruce Bradbury from the University of New South Wales, who's spending the year at the Russell Sage Foundation, Stefan Olofsson from the University of Iceland, and Reeve Vanneman from the University of Maryland. So to these authors, I do thank you. Thank you for traveling here, and thank you for being such extraordinarily collaborative contributors. So now, the Graduate Center's um, interim provost, Louise Lanahan, will say a few words, and then she'll turn the mic over to Tom Riley, who will turn it over to Marcus. Thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Graduate Center. Before I turn to my slightly more formal remarks, I wanted to congratulate Janet and your co, your team and co-authors and so forth, co-editors, but also uh, to welcome Branko, who I had the pleasure of exchanging some hilarious emails over the summer as we were getting down to brass tacks, and it's wonderful to have you here. So it's, it's great. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you so much for coming. We look forward to a very exciting <laughs> spring semester. And Janet, especially to you, my friend. Congratulations. It's, it's wonderful, to, wonderful to be able to be here and help you celebrate. Um, it is my great pleasure to take a moment to say hello to all of you this evening and to have the opportunity to tell you about an important development underway at the Graduate Center. Uh, some of you in the audience whom I recognize will already know about it, for, but for those of you who don't, here I go. Uh, we have recently launched, that is the Graduate Center, an exciting enterprise known as the Advanced Research Collaborative, or ARC, which Janet mentioned, uh, an, in an initiative led by Don Robotham. ARC's mission is to strengthen the Graduate Center's position as an international leader in advanced research in the social sciences and the humanities. And to do this, ARC is creating a network of research communities engaged in dynamic and collaborative research, which brings in fellows from around the world, as kind of visiting fellows along the lines of the Institute for Advanced Study, something like that, uh, as well as partnering them with uh, a number of fellows from within, within CUNY and all of the campuses that constitute uh, our wonderful university, uh, as well as 30 students who take who benefit greatly from the presence of these fellows. So that is what ARC is about. One of its central goals is to draw on the cultural strengths and diversity of New York City and to disseminate, in particular, to disseminate its research through public programming and through <clears throat> the innovative use of new media. So the idea is to do work that matters and to get the word out. ARC aims to address the most intriguing and complex theoretical and policy questions of our time. When we launched ARC, we identified several core research priorities. One is the study of social and economic inequality. As you all know, or you wouldn't be here, um, few contemporary concerns are more pressing, and we are strongly committed, both the Graduate Center and ARC, uh, to establishing the study of inequality as a real intellectual focal point at the Graduate Center. Uh, ARC is building its initiative in the study of inequality by partnering with and supporting several excellent and complementary scholarly endeavors, really already underway under our roof, endeavors that engage diverse facets of, <coughs> of research on inequality, drawing on multiple dif disciplines and utilizing varied analytic, analytic methods, which is one of the reasons it's so wonderful to have Branko here to, to uh, to help us advance one of those methods in particular, or several of those methods in particular. Uh, one of the most important players in all this is LIST. As you already know, LIST is an internationally celebrated producer and provider 
uh, of data, whose, and its purpose is to enable comparative research on socioeconomic outcomes, most especially inequality. With lists anchored here at the Graduate Center, we hope to become a leading venue for scholarship training, public education related to inequality. I think we're really well positioned to do this because of the nature of our faculty, but also because of lists. So we're very, very lucky. I'm delighted that this evening's event will offer you the opportunity to hear about important recent research on inequality carried out by these top scholars in the U.S. Research Committee community. And I'm also delighted to introduce Tom Riley. Thanks. Thank you, Louise. Uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight, and I'm really very excited about the formation of the Directors' Council. Uh, I'm also especially grateful to Dan Alpert of Westwood Capital, to Peter Groves of McKinsey, and to Ken Siegel of Lowe's Corp and Boardwalk Capital, who have agreed to serve on the council along with me. And I'm also very, very grateful to Harold Levy, who is the former New York City Schools Chancellor and who played a very pivotal role in, in initiating the formation of the council. We will be adding a few more uh, members to the council in the coming weeks and months. And the role that the council will play is, is simply to advise and assist as, as LIST seeks to expand its impact, its visibility, and to expand its, its resources. Uh, and really, the, the launch of the, the, the book here, Income Inequality, is, is the perfect occasion uh, to launch, launch the formation of the council because the studies that are published in Income Inequality really reflect the important role that LIST plays in making empirical data available to researchers in a variety of disciplines uh, around the world. And it also shows, really, the, the need for additional data and resources. Uh, Tony Atkinson's forward to the book uh, asks an important question, how can the scope of LIST be widened? Uh, and, and two immediate needs come to mind. One is the need for more up-to-date data. And another is the need for uh, LIST to be more visible and to have greater visibility in terms of the work that it does. And this is going to require an investment, investments. Uh, and the formation of the council is, of course, an important step forward in that direction. So we look forward to supporting and enhancing the important work that LIST does and the important work that it carries out. And with that, I will turn it over to Marcus. Um, I'll do two things. I'll briefly motivate why inequality matters, which I hope is preaching to the converted, but all the same, and then I'll introduce the structure of the book briefly. So the inequality is often dismissed as either being driven by envy or as some kind of luxury that can be afforded if economic growth is sufficiently high. But inequality is, in fact, intrinsically related to economic growth. Um, in particular, what increasing inequality tells you is that the economic growth being enjoyed by those with high income exceeds often quite substantially, as it turns out, that enjoyed by those with low income. Um, the table on the screen here um, shows income growth measured by the average annual growth of household disposable income um, across the roughly past quarter century uh, in selected rich countries. The increase in inequality, which was aptly, captu aptly captured by OECD's publication from a few years back, growing unequal, means that low-income groups, um, here the poorest tenth of the population in the um, middle column of numbers, um, enjoy substantially lower growth rates than those uh, at the top in this case, the richest tenth. And these differences are non-trivial. For instance, in the United States, uh, the top tenth um, enjoyed on average 2% per annum um, growth in household income across 25 years. The bottom enjoyed about one half of a percentage point um, per year. In Sweden, um, the bottom enjoyed 0.4% per year, the top 2.4%. So the multiple between the top and the bottom in the US was uh, four, in Sweden six times. So in these two very different rich countries, 
um, across a quarter of a century, the bottom tenth of the population enjoyed economic growth, which can be charitably um, called anemic. So not only are those at the bottom of the distribution enjoy much uh, fewer resources uh, to consume, those possibilities evolved at a very much slower rate in um, these and, and several other rich countries as well. So even if, uh, apart from other reasons you might think inequality is a concern, I, I think there are many to think so. Even if you focus narrowly on economic growth, inequality does matter. It matters because in times of increasing inequality, um, you know that uh, the expansion of consumption possibilities at the top of the distribution is, is much greater than, than um, uh, for the others. And it would be a very odd position, I think, to take, to think that economic growth, um, an economic growth that is systematically higher for the rich is morally equivalent to one that is evenly enjoyed by all. Um, now, so this is a book about um, income inequality, but when Janet and I were putting this volume together, inviting authors and designing its structure, uh, we decided um, to include as an important element an emphasis on the middle class. We chose that in part because there's been very much cross-national um, and national research with a strong emphasis on the poor, which of course is strongly motivated, but, and there's also recently been a strong emphasis on, on the rich, driven by uh, Tony Atkinson and many of his co-authors, but the middle has not received much attention from cross-national research. But how the middle fares is very important, of course. They are, after all, um, the bulk of the population and also populate many of society's institutions. Now, inequality is by definition a very complex phenomenon, including as it does everybody in society. It both depends on and affects a huge number of, of different factors. We chose not even to try to give an exhaustive treatment of inequality. That's beyond the scope of any single volume, but we chose to focus on a few areas where we thought we, there was a contribution to be made and in which we think the middle is particularly central. So we have a um, short but effective part on trends on inequality. Um, we have another one that focuses on the middle class in the distribution of income looked in, at in several different ways. We have a part on politics which discusses both how politics affects inequality and how in turn inequality affects politics. Uh, there's a part on in employment focused very much on women's work and inequality looked at in, in several different ways and a part on wealth that broadens the analysis of well-being to include also assets and, and liabilities, not only income. And then finally, anticipating the addition of a few new and in our view quite exciting countries to the Luxembourg Income Study Database, um, countries which by now mostly have already been included in our database, we have a part with country case studies. So next we'll sample um, findings from each of these separate parts. Thank you. As we're all aware, no doubt, um, inequality has been rising in the United States, been rising in a number of other countries um, for a few decades now. And um, as Marcus introduced, right, I mean, this upswing in inequality has really um, spawned some growing concern of the status of the middle class. Um, in the U.S. case, the idea that the middle class is somehow shrinking or declining is something that begins to get some popular attention um, really in the early 1980s. Now, of course, middle class is, is a loaded term, right? It's infused with all sorts of cultural and political meanings. But if we set, uh, if, you know, if we set that aside for a moment and um, define the middle class as those households literally in the middle, um, then there's plenty of evidence for middle class decline um, in the US and in some other societies. Now, given those facts, a logical next question is, well, exactly how does that happen, All right? Um, you know, there's been a lot of attention of late, right? Think of Occupy Wall Street and a lot of great research that uh, Marcus mentioned on um, the rise of very high income households. And behind that research and attention, right, lie a number of accounts of rising inequality that suggest that for, you know, owing to a range of institutional, political, um, and economic changes, right, that we've seen a shift of households from the middle, 
right, towards the top of the distribution, a kind of process of upgrading, which has essentially left everyone else behind kind of running, running in place. There are also accounts that um, emphasize downgrading, similarly suggesting for a variety of reasons that some measurable proportion of households has moved from the middle of the distribution, right, shifted toward middle distribution towards the bottom. And finally, there are accounts that suggest, well, what's going on is really a bit of both, right? Um, and that this might be driven also by common processes. So if you think, for instance, of now very, you know, kind of commonplace uh, critical accounts of the effects of globalization on the global north, right, these often suggest that globalization is producing an increasingly polarized job distribution, right? A growing upper tier, a growing bottom tier, and a shrinking uh, middle. Now, in um, this chapter, what my colleagues and I are doing is simply just trying to get a handle um, on the empirics. Right? To the extent that, any, that the middle class has declined, exactly how has it declined? And I'll show you some of the results here in a minute, but I just want to take a moment very quickly, and I'm going to leave out all the details, just to kind of walk you through conceptually um, what we're doing in this chapter. Um, here you see the list data on the U.S. for 1979 and 2004. Now, if you eyeball both of these distributions for a bit, um, you, you'll notice that the 2004 distribution is different from the 79 distribution in at least two ways. Right? First, obviously, right, the um, median of the 2004 distribution is higher, right, which I'm indicating here by these dropped lines. Now, imagine taking those two distributions, right, deflating the, two, the two, 2004 distribution right, so that we match both, right? overlay both, right, and then here, right, we can see that the 2004 distribution also has a different shape, right, so it's different in location and it's different in shape. Um, eyeballing it, it looks less dense in the middle, right, there are fewer households in the middle of the distribution, and again, eyeballing it, the tails are fatter. Uh, this is particularly noticeable in the upper tail, right, that there are more households in the upper tail in 2004 than there were in 79. And so what we're doing in this chapter um, is we use some techniques to essentially quantify that visu visual impression. Um, and that quantification of the change in the shape of the U.S. distribution that we just talked about appears at the top of the second column um, in this table. All right, so relative to 79, the U.S. had by 2004 more households at the top of the distribution in the top 10%, right, fewer households as you can see in the middle, and then more households um, in the bottom 20 or 30 percent. Using the wonderful list data, right, we're able to do the same sort of thing for other rich countries. Um, we're also able to do it for a range of transitional former communist countries and some middle income countries as well. So what do we find? Um, if you would like to stare at this more, it's in the book. Um, what do we find? Right, first, Right, we find that the decline of the middle class has involved more than simple upgrading. Um, rather, it's been a story of polarization, of households moving um, towards the top, yes, but also towards the, towards the bottom. Importantly, though, um, this experience of these societies um, has varied in this regard. Right? So in countries like the US and UK, upgrading, right, or kind of movement from the middle to the top, um, has taken precedence over downgrading. Um, in other societies, though, we see just the opposite pattern. That said, um, by way of conclusion, um, I would emphasize that in broadest terms, right, there is an underlying similarity um, in the experience of rich countries um, over the last few decades. Where it's occurred, middle class decline has occurred via a process of polarization. And to my mind, that suggests the operation of some common global or transnational processes, right, processes that um, reshape the distribution of income in similar ways in very different societies. And um, you know, this is something that perhaps um, our discussant might want to mention because I think about this. Um, his, his work has actually helped me in thinking about this myself. But that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art. No sign. Louis Chauvel. Yeah, thank you very much. In a nutshell now, indeed, uh, the second part of the book uh, is devoted to, to, to the, uh, a more general analysis of the question of the dynamics of middle class. Indeed, 
In the book, we see it's not simply a question of inequalities, of increasing inequalities. It's as well a, a set of trends that are able to shrink the mid middle class into uh, different parts. Uh, and we know different trends that are uh, involved, notably demographic trends such as the rich marry the rich and the poor the poor. Uh, we know other trends of market transformation with more opportunities of upward mobility at the top and desindustrialization that hits the, 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 upper, uh, the, the upper working class, for instance, and economic and social transformation of the design of welfare state with changes in the tax regime and different points that we that uh, we see in other parts of the book. So that for the middle class there is a set of trends of let's say of squeeze that is uh, affecting the, the, the shape of the, of the middle class. Most of the chapters in the second part of the, books, of the book uh, about the middle class retain a definition of middle class between many different other de 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 definitions. You have uh, um, occupational based definitions of middle class. You have more ideological, social, psychological definitions of uh, middle class. The main definition we retained was about the distribution of income and we focus, we make a focus on the median part of the middle class, let's say the big slice between 75 and 125 percent of the median. The median being the level that cuts in two parts, equal parts, the population. In the US, it's 40,000 dollars a year for a full time, full year. Um, uh, the median uh, earning in the, in the US, and focusing on this definition of the, the, the central part of the, of, the, of, the, of the distribution, we analyze, it's uh, not simply my chapter, it's a chapter uh, by Brandolini and, uh, and Atkinson as well, who shows that it's not simply a question of index of inequality, the famous Gini index, it's as well focused or concentrated on the median part of the, of the, of the distribution. And it's possible to show in this book that uh, in many countries, the middle class had been deeply affected. In some countries, in 20 years, 10% uh, and maybe, for instance, in, in, in Finland, almost 20% of the middle class vanished over the last 20 years between, uh, 2000, uh, between 1985 to 2005. So there, there are huge uh, changes and, uh, and uh, transformation in the economic distribution of the population. It's, uh, we have no time to enter into the details of this distribution, but it's very clear that in Sweden, in Germany, in the UK, in the US, and uh, one of the extreme cases is Israel, you have a trend of squeeze at the middle with more poor at the bottom, more rich at the top, good news, uh, and uh, a diminishing uh, intermediate uh, middle class. You have some exceptions. The exception here is France, with no change over the last 20 years. It's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very interesting. Anyway, in the book, you have many processes, trends, trends and analyses of the causes of, 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 of the transformation. There is something, one thing that is extremely important in the analysis, it's the dynamics. We detect in uh, many countries, we detect a trend of auto-accelerating increase of inequality based on uh, birth cohort and social generation replacement. The old dream of the middle class of the 60s is going to retirement with the seniors and is replaced by new generations facing over-education, high uh, um, high uh, housing uh, indexes and many new problems such as uh, the uh, accordion family and the, uh, the boomerang family um, where the young poor generation is hosted uh, by, the, by the poor and the richer are uh, uh, taking other opportunities. 
So indeed, we are able to detect many trends of increase in inequality, and we see that inequality is a large and a larger foot that we have to squeeze because it is plenty of new juice for research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, as you can see, the title of this uh, section of the book is Politics, Inequality, Political Behavior, and Public Opinion. There are two contributions. Both of them, though, in slightly different ways, focus on what political scientists sometimes call political voice, the introduction of inputs into the political system. And in particular, on the role of political attitudes and participation, in explaining cross-national variation in government redistribution policies. The section addresses two key questions. Each of the, each of the contributions address one of those. Uh, first is the rate of political participation by income groups related to the extent and type of redistribution toward or away from those groups. In short, does politics matter? Secondly, how do political public attitudes toward government redistribution influence the politics of redistribution, and more generally, what, how are, what are public attitudes and how are they formed? That's the subject of the second contribution. The first article by myself and my two co-authors, Dave Jesuit and Piotr Paradowski, really attempts two basic tasks. First of all, it offers an empirical examination of how middle class income shares are affected by direct taxes and social, social transfers social insurance and other social transfers. Um, the, the, there is a great deal of detail here, but the bottom line is that there is a great deal of cross-national variation in, in, this, in this regard. There are some commonalities, but there's also a good deal of variation across the countries we study. Uh, in an effort to explore this variation, we've considered a number of variables uh, that, that have been associated with this cross-national variation in the existing literature. We do a country level analysis, but I won't really go into that here. That's sort of the normal way of addressing these sort of things, this sort of thing. But we also do a multi-level analysis that permits us to control for the basic socio-demographic characteristics at the household level that are, are associated in ways that politicians can't directly affect uh, with, with the kind of the baseline of social benefit provision and also to some degree taxes um, and, and, and focus on particular modes of political participation, these are at the quintile level. In particular, we're interested in voting, the most basic political act, belonging to labor unions, contacting elected or public officials directly in one way or another, and participating in protests or demonstrations. The next slide just offers a flavor of these, uh, what are independent variables for us. We're focusing on electoral turnout uh, here, as you can see, the, the bars reflect turnout, but not turnout on average as a share of the eligible population or the eligible electorate, but turnout by income quintile. To just focus on two of these, kind of the extremes, and they have to be at the extremes of the, of the, the graphic as well. In Australia, not only is average turnout very high, which, which, which it is, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, compulsory voting in, in, in in Australia, and it has been for a very long time. But most important for our purposes, there's very little uh, difference between income groups turnout in Australian elections. The lowest quintile and the middle quintiles turn out at a very similar rate to the top quintile. In the United States, not only is average turnout much lower, but more interesting for our purposes, um, there's a, a, a very substantial income skew in turnout. Uh, the lowest income quintile turns out at a much lower rate than even the quintile just above it, which turns out at a much lower rate than the quintile just above it, and so on up the income scale. We're interested in these not only for their own sake, but for what they say about distributive politics. The other article in our section, which I'll very briefly summarize, um, is sort of a companion to ours in a nice way, I think complementary. Um, it looks not so much at active participation in politics, but public attitudes towards government redistribution. Um, the central question Toth and Keller address is, how do public attitudes towards government redistribution shape the nature and extent of redistribution? 
The short answer is, and I'm much simplifying here, and it's not my own work, so you know, I'm hoping I'm doing this properly. Uh, the short answer is that there is a relationship, of course, between individuals' objective economic situation and their preference for redistribution, sometimes called the median voter theorem in political science circles. But, and I think this is the takeaway from their article, it's an imperfect relationship. Attitudes towards redistribution are shaped also, and, and in many ways just as importantly, or even more importantly, by such subjective considerations. They consider a very wide range of these, but a few of them that I found especially interested, interesting were people's views on how undesirable, uh, how undesirable inequality is, and, and related to that, how much inequality they think there is in their country. Um, who bears the responsibility for low income? Is it low income recipients themselves or is there a broader kind of social context? People differ a good deal on that. And finally, on the prospects for social mobility. Um, do people feel that there's a lot of mobility in their, in their country and thus the government has less role in this area? Or do they feel that income mobility is limited and there might be a larger role for government? So uh, I'm, I'm, I will complete there. Thank you. Nancy Fulbright. Thank you for coming tonight. The list provides a magnificent opportunity to think, um, to uh, figure out uh, what the impact of changes in women's work and in household structure might be on the larger inequality story. So I'm going to briefly summarize a couple of the um, chapters, uh, chapters in this section and uh, focus my attention on the article that I co-authored um, with Janet, and I'm not going to go exactly in order, but uh, try to um, put them together in a, a sequence that kind of um, uh, uh, flows slightly differently. So uh, one of the interesting questions is how labor market policies in these countries uh, may have affected patterns of household structure, which in turn relate to household inequality. And Margarita Estevez Abe and uh, Tanya Hethe Mayer show that strictly, labor, strictly regulated labor markets have a negative effect, uh, whereas a large public sector has a positive effect. Now, this is not necessarily a cause and effect story. Uh, could the causality probably goes both ways? But it is pretty clear that labor market policies are either um, are both pro probably both reflecting and uh, provoking some significant changes in. Um, the way, uh, some significant differences in the way households interact with a larger um, uh, economy. So the next question really is how these differences in household structure and in women's labor force participation might be affecting the trends and, and patterns of household inequality that the other chapters have commented on. And this is a big and complicated debate, but Esping Anderson uh, made a kind of dramatic intervention um, in it by asserting that increases in women's employment were probably a causal factor in the increased patterns of inequality that are visible in some countries, which is a slightly uncomfortable uh, idea for those who see that as a largely uh, uh, otherwise progressive uh, uh, social force. So I think one of the uh, important uh, contributions of Susan Harkness's essay in this volume is that she mobilizes a lot of empirical data to show that um, in 18 countries at least, that does not seem to be the case. Now, a lot depends on the counterfactual and a lot of technical details are, are at play here. Uh, but um, I think she does offer some prima facie, some pretty good evidence that you can't blame the increased inequality that you're seeing on increases in uh, women's labor force participation. And she also disaggregates the components of the, the change in a way that uh, helps us understand um, kind of what what exactly is going on. But this whole debate uh, has really left out consideration of the impact of women's unpaid work on household living standards, as in fact have most of the articles in this volume that rely on market income rather than an extended measure of um, income that includes the value of household work. And that has some pretty um, uh, significant implications. And what we did in this chapter was use some data from the uh, Harmonized European Time Use Study to estimate the amount of time that people were devoting, both men and women, were devoting to unpaid work. Um, and then create some synthetic households where we imputed the number of hours and an estimate of their market value to the uh, households in um, these 
countries. And what you can see from this table is that unpaid work is a very significant percentage of total work, more so for women than for men, uh, but um, really across gender. So if you impute a market value to that, even a conservative estimate is gonna really dramatically change both the level of income and the uh, distribution of income that is, um, uh, that these, these households that are, is, that are affecting these households' living standards. So uh, it turns out a lot depends on uh, what measure of inequality you use, plus there's a lot of variation across countries. Uh, but uh, one of the things you can see from this graph is that in a variety of different, across many different countries and using three different measures of inequality, uh, it's generally the case that uh, market income is distributed much more unequally than the sum of market income and the value of non-market household work, which is what is often termed extended income. This isn't surprising because uh, on the uh, wage level, you're imputing uh, a value that's uh, in, uh, based on an approximation that varies very little itself. But it's also the case that the amount of household work done doesn't very much uh, across households. So it generally has an equalizing effect. Um, and uh, I think this has important implications for thinking about long-run trends because, of course, what we're seeing in all of these countries is a shift away from household production uh, towards greater reliance on the market, especially on the part of women. So uh, that implies that actually Esping Anderson's hypothesis may have been correct. When you look at extended income rather than uh, uh, market income, the uh, movement of women out of household production into market income has probably contributed to an overall increase in inequality in living standards. Um, that uh, deserves some consideration. Thank you. Thank you especially good chapter, I might add. Um, just kidding. Bruce Bradbury. I see we have a little clock here. Okay. Um, so I'm talk talking about the papers in the wealth section. Um, and there are four chapters uh, in the volume that draw on data from the Luxembourg Wealth Study, uh, which there's, the naming is a little bit confusing, but it's essentially it's a subcomponent of the, the whole Luxembourg Income Study project, and where the data sets have been assembled with wealth and household assets and debt data um, for a smaller number of countries than for the, the remainder of the, the study. And there are four chapters um, in the book, which, which look at this data. Uh, two of them, uh, if you like, talk more generally about the distributions of assets, debts, and the, dis the inter interrelationship between income and wealth distributions. And then the other two chapters look at particular components of wealth um, and focus on those. And one of those is my, my chapter, which I'll talk about now, which is talking about housing and, re and its role in providing for retirement retirement living standards. So two decades ago, in a very influential report, the World Bank talked about uh, and advocated a three pillars model for support, in consumption support in retirement. Um, they talked about three aspects. Um, one would be a public minimum pension, another would be contributory pensions, where people get out, uh, receive similar to what they put in, and then also private savings. And they argued that it was important to have multiple pillar system because each of those pillars is subject to uh, particular risks. Um, and the more pillars you have, the more chance you have of covering yourself of, against either economic, political, or social risks affecting one of those. Um, so the argument I'm making in this chapter is that home ownership, which is part of private saving, but is particularly important and has particular characteristics that make it deserve a title as a fourth, deserve a title as a fourth pillar. Um, so owning your home in retirement, um, it provides housing services. You have a house and you have the consumption services of the, um, the house. You live in that house. Um, and at the same time, it also frees up income for non-housing consumption. Um, and, so, and it's dif different from other forms of retirement asset in the sense that you are actually living in that asset. And so I'll talk about here particularly about what lessons the other countries um, in this can learn from the high high home ownership countries, and I'll be talking mainly about the US and Australia here. Um, so these are the countries in the Luxembourg Wealth Study, plus and the Australian data is, um, has been added in by myself 
and will be in the study in the future. Um, and so what, sh and, and these data are from around the year 2000, um, which for the study I'm looking at is actually good that this data is so old, in the sense that it abstracts from the turmoil in housing markets that many of these ha countries had during the middle of the 2000s. Um, and the, at the bottom axis of this graph shows the disposable income replacement rate, which is often used as a summary shorthand as a measure of the adequacy of retirement benefit systems. And so that's the average income of older people, people over 65, relative to those of what I call prime age, that's people um, uh, from 45 to 59, when their income's at the highest. And you see the US is up there having a very high replace, income replacement rate in retirement. And Australia is down the other end with the lowest income replacement rate. And coincidentally, they're the two countries which also have the highest rates of home ownership in retirement. And so in Australia, essentially, home ownership here is, is compensating for this low income retirement rate, low, low level of income in retirement. Whereas in the US, if anything, it's, it's overcompensating. It's, it's helping to push the living standards of retired people in the US above um, non-retired people. Um, so this, is, this graph here is for the average household. Um, so then I'll present one more look, looking at uh, inequality in living standards amongst the elderly. And so the, this graph here shows the average income of the 20% of households with the lowest income relative to middle-income households, which are here are defined as just the 60% of people in the middle of the distribution. Um, so here, again, the US stands out as where the poor, um, low-income low elderly are much, have a much lower income level than those in the other countries. Um, when, and then in the paper, I won't talk about the details of this now, but then I add in the value of housing services and take account of the, the impact of the cost of housing to get a more comprehensive measure of consumption that takes, takes housing into account. Um, and there we get quite a different story. Um, so here the blue bars are based on income, and the, the red bars is this more extended income concept uh, for the same population groups. And here what you find, um, and, I'll, and I'll focus in particular on Australia and the US because they're the two countries which have the highest home ownership rates. Um, oh, try it that way. Um, and what we find here is quite a different story in those two countries. Um, in Australia, home ownership is very equalising amongst the retired population. And that essentially stems from the fact that home ownership rates are very high and they're very uniform across the elderly population in Australia. Many low-income people also own their houses. In the US, home ownership doesn't change the distribution at all. In the, so um, just as the low-income elderly in the US have lower incomes, they also have less housing ownership. Um, and so I think these um, finish up with what are like broader implications. And one of the, um, the statistics which I didn't present is that home ownership rates in many of these countries which have lower home ownership rates amongst the elderly, the home ownership rates amongst the middle-aged fa families are actually quite high. And so we expect that with those countries, they will soon become like Australia and the US um, with high rates of home ownership amongst their retired population. And so if you like, the lesson here is that the, the impact on retirement living standards and inequality of living standards amongst the retired will, ver will depend very much upon that distribution of home ownership and who, who does own their home and who doesn't. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Stefan Olofsson. Hello. It's a great pleasure to talk about Iceland in this context. Uh, uh, so, uh, firstly, why is Iceland interesting in, in, for the topic of income distribution? Well, Iceland had the dubious luck of producing what the IMF called the biggest bubble economy ever. 
in relation to the size of the national economy. This was not primarily a housing bubble as in Ireland or in Spain or in the US. It was primarily a business speculation bubble, in fact. Uh, it was also a housing bubble, but, but primarily business speculation. And when that bubble burst in the autumn of 2008, it was the most spectacular financial collapses with close to 90% of the banking system going bankrupt within a period of two weeks. So it was an extreme development in, in all accounts. And we are telling the story of income distribution in, 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 in this whole thing. Looking at the, the income distribution inequality development before and after the collapse. And we particularly analyze the role of financial earnings, but also the role of taxation and benefit policies, the welfare uh, aspects. But first, looking at the income inequality development. Here we have the Gini inequality coefficients. Uh, there are two measures, the black columns, uh, refer to all taxable incomes, including capital gains, which is often left out. The gray columns, leave out the capital gains. And, and, and the line at the bottom is actually the difference, and that shows actually the contribution of the speculation bubble to the inequality. You see it's rising, the line is rising until in 2007 when it reaches the top. So that's when the bubble was at its height, it burst uh, the year later, and then the inequality uh, came down uh, uh, to levels which were close to the year of um, uh, 98, uh, 99, uh, or 2000. And uh, here we have a comparison of, uh, of the top uh, of the income share of the top 1%. Uh, Iceland is plotted there against uh, the famous Piketty and Sayers uh, data for the US. This is from the Sayers update of, of this year. Uh, with data for the US up to 2012. Uh, famously, this share started to increase after 1980. Uh, Iceland uh, went uh, on, on to this track in the late 1990s, gradually to begin with, as you see, but with this tremendous momentum. And in, at the top in 2007, the top 1% in Iceland was uh, gaining about 19.5%, while the US was with 23.5%. So this was quite weird for a Nordic welfare state, if you look at it that way. Um, uh, and in fact, there was the consequence of a, of a considerable neoliberal experiment in terms of policy. After the collapse, you see how the income share of the top 1% came drastically down. And it has stayed down where it is on the line, uh, probably also last year. It may increase a little this year, but modestly, which is different from the development in the US. And then turning to the role of the financial uh, incomes, here you see the role of financial earnings in the total earnings of the top 1%, which is the black columns. Top 10% is the, the gray columns. And you see how, as the bubble gathered momentum up to 2007, in 2007, the top 1% had uh, about 85%, 85-6% of their uh, overall earnings were capital income, including capital gains. Capital gains were, in fact, about half of the capital earnings. And that came down when the bubble burst, uh, but surprisingly, it didn't go further down than to 42% uh, for the top 1%, which is, in fact, still higher than what uh, the, uh, it had been before the year 2000. Uh, so uh, so uh, our estimate would be that once the economy and the, and the stock market starts uh, climbing again, there are still significant assets, even though a lot was lost during the, the, the collapse, there are still significant assets which will start producing big uh, financial earnings again on the upswing, as in the US. And uh, lastly, the role of taxation. Um, here you see the total effective tax burden of the top 1%. Um, from uh, from uh, 1992 up to 2011, you see how the how the how uh, how the tax burden was coming down. 
to its lowest in, at the height of the bubble between 2005 and 2007, when it was down to 13%, but increased again after the collapse. And, and it came down because financial earnings were taxed uh, much lower than other earnings, employment earnings, pension earnings, and, 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 and things like that. Uh, so, uh, so as the bubble gained momentum, the top income groups were gaining also with uh, favorable tax rates. And, uh, and the, the reason why the tax uh, burden increases again is, sec firstly, the, the, the decline of financial earnings. Uh, secondly, more redistribution policies. We did get a social democratic government after the collapse, and they raised the tax burden both on financial incomes, they doubled it, and they raised the income uh, tax on, on the top income groups. So altogether, uh, the decline in uh, inequality, which came after the collapse, was two-thirds due to financial earnings, one-third due to taxation policies. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. And our last panelist, Reeve Vanneman, from Iceland to India. Okay, um, uh, we have a series of logos here. Uh, at the bottom, the IHDS stands for the India Human Development Survey, which is the uh, first uh, all India survey that's really collected good income data uh, for India. This is a survey I helped organize with colleagues at Maryland and the National Council of Applied Economic Research in Delhi, uh, and is now a part of, of the List Data Bank. And I think it's one of the really important new directions uh, for LIS. Uh, uh, thanks to the wonderful work that Janet and Marcus and Terry do here, uh, do at Luxembourg and here uh, at CUNY. Uh, my main point I want to make is that the inclusion of India and other middle income countries is going to change the way we think about inequality in a global context. Uh, middle income countries have much higher levels of income inequality than do the countries we've talked about uh, for the rest of the evening uh, uh, today. Uh, and this is not a widely appreciated fact. Um, earlier work has missed this much higher level of income inequality in middle income countries, primarily because of the lack of good data. By that I mean the lack of good list data. And now that list includes uh, uh, these middle income countries, we're gonna have a very different global perspective on income inequality. Uh, to give you an example of one of the problems, here's a map that ap appeared in uh, my local paper uh, a little while ago, uh, which uh, pictures income inequality uh, across the world with the red countries having lots of inequality, the blue countries less inequality, with the US sort of in purple there in the middle. And what you can observe is that India is bluer, the meaning it has less inequality than the United States. And anybody that's been to India and opened their eyes and looked around can, could not believe that uh, uh, those data are, are actually uh, the case. Um, uh, inequality in India is not only extreme, but it's juxtaposed one right next to, uh, uh, to another. Uh, the problem here is the kind of data uh, that went into that map. It's not the problem of the, of the map maker or, or the people calculating it but the, uh, the differences in the income data that underlie uh, those statistics. Uh, the World Bank puts together uh, uh, inequality data from around the world. Uh, for India, um, they use consumption data that comes from the National Sample Survey, and they get a figure of about 0.37, which is a rather moderate level of income inequality. Uh, the IHDS, however, uh, actually calculated actual uh, 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 income inequality based on actual income data, and we have, as you can see, an astoundingly much higher level of income inequality uh, that is much more believable and much more uh, uh, what people see when you, when you go to India. Well, we also collected data, uh, consumption data, uh, like the National Sample Survey, and calculated income inequality there, and we found a level that's very much similar to what the National Sample Survey uh, collects. So the problem here is the lack of income data for middle-income countries. Uh, and when you calculate inequality based on consumption data, especially for these middle-income countries, you get much lower levels. That's very misleading. <coughs> Here are a bunch, of, uh, a group of list countries in purple, the high-income countries, and then some uh, middle-income countries in blue, 
uh, 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 primarily uh, Latin American countries. And in green are the states of India. We did it separately for each state because most states in India are as large or larger than most of the countries in uh, the list data bank. And what, what the graph is meant to represent is how stark, we have two very different levels here. Okay, on all the purple countries, despite the variation that we talk about a lot between high, uh, between uh, the growth in income inequality in the U.S. and the high levels of inequality, all of them are lower than the middle income countries. And there's no middle income country or no middle income state in India that has uh, uh, le less inequality than any high income country. So we're talking about two very different uh, uh, world economic worlds here. Uh, so uh, I'll leave you that. Uh, when income is measured correctly, uh, that is when it's measured in lists, the high income countries have far less income inequality than, than do the middle income countries. And we need to start thinking about income inequality in this more global perspective. Thank you, Reeve. I'm going to turn the floor over to Bronco, who's going to make some remarks and then open us up for question and answer. Uh, well, thank you very much, Janet. First, of course, uh, I would like to say that we have about uh, 30 minutes, right, for Q&A. Yeah. I would uh, take, uh, uh, and you would just keep me on track on that, four minutes. So I will be very, very, I hope very brief. Um, uh, first, I would like to thank Janet and Luis for such nice, welcoming comments. And uh, really, I'm very, very appreciative of that. And since I hope to stay here for a while, I will be very brief tonight, because I hope they would have other opportunities to speak. Uh, also, I, I think the book illustrates and really showcases the wealth of things that you can do with this data. So this is, I think, actually really remarkable. I mean, you have seen, actually, you do politics, you do income inequality in rich countries, you do income inequality in poor countries, you do women, unpaid labor. There is really an incredible uh, number, and of course, individual country studies, and we have had four in the book. So that's really absolutely remarkable. Now, what I'm going to do is actually, first, Arthur mentioned, and also, uh, 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 Reeve mentioned at the end, I would just simply like to sort of say a few words, how does it look from the global perspective, because that's essentially what I do. And what the book does, if you were to summarize, you would say, well, what we, of course, we have rich countries mostly here, and there are two developments which happened over the last 30 years. Very, very rough summary. First, inequality just went up in most countries. Secondly, there was a polarization of the hollowing out of the middle class. So that's what basically what happened. Now, then you say, okay, well, if that happened in each individual country, does it mean that in the world that the same thing has happened? And the answer is no. What happened in the level, the global level, was to some extent the opposite of what we have seen at each individual country level. And that's a little bit sort of difficult and maybe at first counterintuitive, but it's basically you're going from a two-dimensional world, which really deals with rich countries, to a three-dimensional world, which has to accommodate what happened, and which was the rise of China, India, and basically Asia. So what this graph shows here is that on the horizontal axis, you put everybody in the world from the poorest, there are actually people at uh, the, low, uh, the left uh, uh, of the graph, with like from the lowest percentile, to the top percentile, which is 100th percentile. And then you look at what was the real income increase at these different percentiles. And the story is there, I mean, sort of again, very roughly, is that you have had, this is like, look at the very top, where actually people who have gained the most, which is about 90% in real terms over 20 years, 1988 to 2008. And it's essentially, I mean, you can call it China's middle class or India's middle class. These are people who are actually very poor by Western standards because we are talking about $4 or $5 per day, which is really below, it's one half of the U.S. poverty line. But they are actually gained a lot in terms of relative income. So they are actually gained 90%. And the people who have actually not gained very much at all, who have been mostly stagnant, is what you can call U.S. lower middle class, of which we have heard a lot today. These are people who actually had growth of income of 10%. So obviously that raises a number of political and other issues that you can sort of imagine that actually there may be some 
whether there was a trade-off, whether there was a causality between these two, what does it mean for the politics of each of, of the country, both China and the US and so on. And the third point is that if you look at the very end of the graph, which is actually people at the top 1%, people who actually have about you know, $110, $150 or more per day, uh, of course, that's actually people who have gained a lot. And this explains this very unusual shape of the graph where you have the peak around the median, and we can call it the median global class, not really middle because these are relatively poor people, and then you have really trough of really at around the 80th percentile in the world, and then you have another peak, a local peak, which is the top 1%. So uh, what I wanted to illustrate is really that, that the global developments have been different from what we see when we study each individual country. So having said that, and I, uh, you know, I would actually stop uh, with my remarks here uh, and uh, open the floor for Q&A to the authors. So I think that the authors might want to actually come up to the you know, here, and I would appreciate if you could please also just uh, make, of course, a brief question and also address it to the author or maybe just address to the topic so that we can easily sort of decide who is going to, to answer the question. Should we ask this from the, yeah, I think that you, Marcus, if you want. Oh, sorry, is that microphone on? I'm not sure that it is. Um, the, there is actually, there's quite fascinating work on the distribution of wealth on a global level by Tony Shorrocks and his co-authors. That's not covered by this book. Um, this is a book about the middle class and we think they might not have stashed away quite as much money as, <laughs> as the very top. Um, I guess it goes to the question, what's the middle then? If the, the, yes. That will, um, right. that, where do you a, find the middle? <laughs> but one of the big problems, I mean, this is a generic problem. I'll be quite brief about this. The top is usually quite poorly captured by survey data. So if one is interested at the very top, one needs to do what, what Tomar Piketty and Emmanuel Saez and Tony Atkinson have done, which is to focus um, on other sources but those other sources tend to be tax sources. So they also miss um, what is stashed away. So that there's really nobody who, who has a very good assessment of the distributional implications of that. It's the best guesstimates of that, of course, is that, that inequality is in fact a lot greater than, than what any sources reveal to you. But what the truth is, nobody knows. If I can just say one word, is basically in the paper that actually that this graph is from, but the paper is going to be published in a week or two. We actually try to estimate, to account for the underestimate of the top 1% in household service. And indeed, the Gini coefficient goes down, up significantly when it happens. But just to give you an idea, it's not an even situation because you can have Indians who are in top 1% who are actually underestimated their income, but they are not at the top 1% globally. So there are really difficult things here, and then nobody has estimated, that's another topic, is the thing that you mentioned, which is the illicit financial flows and how that affects the total inequality, not to my knowledge, actually. Uh, anybody else? Arthur, would you like to add something? No? no? Okay. We go to that. Oh, is it working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a question for Nancy Fulbright. Uh, I'm Paula England. Um, Nancy, you said, if I understood you correctly, that while um, unpaid work on balance, you think, equalizes the income distribution within countries, uh, the paid work of women, uh, you think, does not disequalize, as had been claimed by um, Esping Anderson. And, uh, I know from some work that Janet and I did in a published article using list data that in virtually all these countries, women with high education are employed more than women with low education, despite the fact that women with high education tend to be married to richer guys. So, you know, the sorting of marriage tends to have the women who, in one sense, 
quote, their families need the income the least, being the ones that are actually the most likely to um, be employed. And that's roughly true in at least most of the countries we looked at. So I would think that the more that's true, the more women's earnings would, if the counterfactual is no woman is employed, for example, disequalize family income. Not to say I'm against women's employment, I'm still for it, but um, so, I, so can you explain the intuition about how that isn't true, et cetera? Sure. Uh, yes. yeah. Okay, first look at market earnings, just look at market income. Uh, you know, why has there been a debate about, about that? Well, there's basically two effects. There's the one you described, which is a disequalizing effect, but then there's the fact that there are all these women who are assigned zero contribution, and as they enter the labor force, uh, they they are they are coming in, so the, they're they're increasing. You know, it's just there are two countervailing effects, and that's what Susan Harkness and Esping Anderson that you have a bunch of women who were married to low earning men who become earners. Okay, so uh, you're you're adding them in. You're adding in a bunch of people at the low end of the household distribution who are going from z absolutely zero uh, to a contribution. On the other hand, you have higher education among women and assortative mating that's increasing the inequality. So the, w the way that shakes out probably depends on where you are in the, at the, in the, in the trajectory of women's entrance into uh, the labor force, right? But I, I think that makes it all the more interesting to point out that there's something really uh, misleading about valuing women's contribution at zero simply because they have market earnings. And uh, women who are not employed in the market are generally working more than 40 hours a week, providing childcare, meals, doing things that families have to pay for if that labor is, is not available. And so that's uh, why you get a different uh, result if you factor in the value of non-market work. Thanks. Thank you, let's go to the next one. Good evening, I'm Smitha Narula, and my question goes to, um, it was triggered by the, the India presentation, but I, I, it would apply to others. To what extent is the data on income uh, sort of disaggregated by other categories, uh, whether it's race or caste, so that you're revealing something potentially about discrimination at the same time as you're revealing something about inequality? It occurred to me mostly in the context of the Indian case where um, caste plays a significant role in the distribution of income, even in the distribution of occupations, particularly for those at the bottom of the caste system who are still assigned to caste-based occupations. And it would be incredibly illuminating to those of us and others who do work on, on discrimination to be able to have that data. But the same question, I think, also goes for other countries. And have you, um, have you seen any trends there? And is it part of the database itself? We have pretty good caste data in the IHDS, and as you say, of course, a huge differences in income uh, uh, by caste. Uh, we, ha we have not uh, decomposed the total levels of inequality separately by caste, but you would be, s uh, there's enormous amounts of inequality within caste as well, so that, uh, uh, it's not as great as you might think or as we thought at first. Let me just add a couple of sentences to note. I think we've said this, but just to underscore, uh, he's not only our researcher in the book, he's also the keeper of the data set. He's the producer of the data set. And so we're very fortunate in our list community that several of our researchers are in fact run the surveys. And that's true. Uh, it's true in the Japan case. It's true in South Africa. It's true in India and several of the other cases. So. Uh, Reeve is not only reporting on the data, he created the data set. And so, um, but it is important to say, for those of you who aren't sort of data geeks, as we often say, we do provide micro data. And so the data are available at the household and person level. We provide the data with as much household demography, occupational data, geocoding as the data provider will allow us. In smaller countries, sometimes these are suppressed, but if they're worried about, you know, confidentiality. But for the most part, in our data sets, we know uh, the educational level and the employment status of everybody in the household. We know race and ethnicity to the extent that the survey reports it. We know uh, immigration status. That's difficult to harmonize. Countries report that differently. Sometimes we know the sending country, how long they've been there. Uh, in almost all of the federal 
cases, we know what state or territory they're in. So it does vary by data set, but they're actually very highly disaggregated. I don't think we've said this, but there are, Terry, you would know, how many variables are there in the list template? 746 variables in the list template. So the point is, is that one could, if your question concerned CAST, uh, you know, one could ask that. So that's generally what our goal is, is to provide that kind of fine micro-level detail. Obviously, that, you know, for in the case of South Africa, that would be actually a very good example. And there are, of course, studies, and in the book as well, there is, a, you know, disaggregation between, ra I mean, racial disaggregation. Yeah. Do I see? Okay. You, get, you provided fantastic data on <clears throat> the variation in the trends of inequality and also a lot of interesting variation in possible causal factors. I wonder, have you, are you comfortable with synthesizing them all and saying which ones you think are most important under what circumstances? I guess it will be for everybody, this question. Uh, the short the, uh, thank you. Uh, the short answer would be uh, no. I mean, I, I guess I'm not. Um, I think that um, you know, just thinking about um, our contribution to this volume. I mean, there's, a, there's the, the experience of rich countries has been pretty heterogeneous. Um, I could tell you just so stories. Um, I have some intuitions, but um, you know, in terms of what we've done um, in this chapter, it's. It's uh, we've we stuck very closely to the data and simply describing the data. Um, I think that um, you know it's an important first step, and I think it does help us adjudicate um, different accounts of inequality. Um, you know, the one thing I would be comfortable in saying is that you know the you know sort of pure upgrading account of inequality um, doesn't hold water, and right? uh, just clearly, and um, I think that's important because I think you know the, it. Um, it, the upgrading account, I mean, is sort of less offensive, I think, to lot, you know, mo common notions of distributive justice than other possibilities. So I think it's the fact that we do in see, in fact, see polarization um, with, um, you know, some mix of this kind of upgrading and downgrading um, does give us some leverage on, on kind of big theoretical debates about inequality. No. Louis, would you like? Yeah, indeed. Uh, all the stuff is, is fantastically interesting, but the most stri striking thing, I think, is that the world of our children will be much more shaky than ours. And uh, when you work on inequalities, you, you, you sometimes you don't like inequalities, but this topic is intrinsically fascinating. And in terms of dark crystal ball sociology, uh, the sociology of pessimistic uh, things, uh, inequality is extremely interesting and when you're interested not only on, in India but in China as well, yes, new things are coming that are almost unanticipable and uh, we are working to, to, to read better this future of inequality that is uh, more and more open in front of us. Yeah, you have I'd like to briefly, I think, say two things to the, this question. One is that, that um, I think a valuable source for understanding the causes of changes in inequality across the years are two books published by the OECD, uh, Growing Unequal in 2008 and Divided We Stand in 2011, both of which extensively used list data to try to apportion um, the causes onto different factors, and no very simple story arises from, from that. But I, and indeed, in part, this is because it really is a very complex phenomenon. I'll give a single example, which I think says that it's, it's very hard to, to tell what the cause of, of, in a sense, one change can give rise to diff, several different things. So several countries chose to tax income differently in the early 1990s, depending on if it came from capital markets or from other sources, dual income tax system. And typically the capital income was taxed at a much lower rate, which was also flat, a flat rate rather than progressive. Now, 
this had at least three different effects on inequality. The immediate effect is to increase uh, inequality because now part of income is, is taxed on a flat rate rather than progressive, which reduces the inequality reducing effect of, of taxes. Um, a second effect, of course, is that as capital market inequality increases, you'll have a faster rate of growth in inequality than before, again, because taxes do less to reduce the increase. But the third effect is that if you now, if you have owned and owned business, it's now very advantageous for you to book things as capital income rather than as earnings. Um, so th there's a lot of so-called income shifting going on. And now when, then in the, uh, across the course of years, when capital markets were generating a lot more income inequality, it's very convenient politically to say, well, this increase in inequality is coming from capital markets. There's nothing we can do about it. When in fact, the, it, much of the source of it is the very change in policy that was instituted in the 1990s and, and saying whether or not it's politically driven or driven by markets is kind of a matter of, of, of taste rather than a matter of fact. It is remarkable, maybe I can go to Stefan actually, that remarkable graph about the increase in the effective tax rate on top 1% in Iceland. Would you like to comment how was it politically done? Well, politically, it was done by, as I mentioned, doubling the, uh, the tax on, on financial earnings. And secondly, they uh, introduced, we had the flat uh, rate income tax before the crisis. Uh, so marginal uh, tax rates had been lowered. But the new government which came in after the collapse, they, they uh, put in a three bracket uh, income tax system again which made the higher income groups furious and, um, and they are uh, putting up a big fight nowadays for, uh, for turning back to what they see as more efficient, more favorable tax regimes. And wasn't there a little gender dimension to this? In the taxation? In the new regime? Well, in the new regime, <laughs> well, we had the first uh, female uh, prime minister who, who was leading this uh, social democratic government, and and and, and that was uh, uh, that was. Uh, I mean, they they. They're the ones who did it. They did it. Yes, <laughs> they did it. <laughs> we have ten more minutes, so we'll, because we start a little bit later. Hello, uh, Michael Cooper. Thanks so much for a fascinating presentation. I'm uh, neither an economist nor, uh, nor a data geek, so if you'll forgive me, I'm just going to ask a question from a layperson's perspective. Uh, I have two little boys, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. I was walking them to school a few months ago, and my seven-year-old's rather precocious, and he was sort of lost his own thoughts, and out of the blue, he suddenly turned to me and said, Papa, you know, when I grow up, I don't want to be poor, and I don't want to be rich. I want to be between the middle and the rich. And I said, oh, that's really interesting, Charlie. I think what you're saying is that you want to be upper middle class when you grow up. I said, I think you can do that. You know, you're a very smart boy and you're a very hardworking boy. I think your chances of getting into the upper middle class are very good. So my question quite simply is, given all you've said this evening, when I told Charlie that his chances of getting into the upper middle class are very good, was I lying to him? Well, this is a cohort issue. We, we want to. Uh, yes, what do you say? Indeed, I come from a country, France, where nothing has changed uh, but on wealth issues, and uh, yeah, it's another uh, question. But yeah, the interesting issue for the new developed countries, I mean India, China, Brazil and so on, is the skyrocketing uh, situation of the upper middle class almost everywhere. Uh, not in Western, old, uh, Western, uh, old developed capitalist countries where we are mature 
almost nature in terms of upper middle class. But when you when you go to Brazil, to 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 Russia, to China, you have a new dynamic that is absolutely incredible. But you have to to see the other part of the reality that is uh, those who are not able to 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 catch up with 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 with, with the upper middle class. But yeah. Uh, I like taboo questions and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, maybe you have had an opportunity to read uh, Coming Apart by Charles Murray. I, 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 I see cracks in the walls and uh, beginning of, 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 but the big issue today is um, the upper middle class is now a new actor in the development of many countries, able to get rid of uh, the old working class and, uh, and the rest of the, of the problematic uh, suburban, uh, new poor uh, parts of, of many, uh, of many uh, societies. And yeah, it's a 21st century question uh, what is the long term, which are the long term consequences of that new dynamics? Indeed, in this room, we are almost all upper middle class. It depends on our assets, but uh, in terms of, 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 of uh, education, income, and so on, we are, we are speaking about ourselves in, with this question of upper middle class opportunities. The problem is the success or not of our children, but uh, it's an issue about social mobility, much more than on uh, inequality today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Bruce, I, I, first I want to say that actually next time maybe you should bring your son here because he seems to actually have very, obviously very good comments. Okay. Oh, let me, oh, okay, go ahead. And then. Like the joke that the best way to make a small fortune is to start with a big one. So if, if you really want to want a child to kind of get to the middle, upper middle classes, you should start by being very rich, then regression to the mean will take care of, <laughs> of the fact that he, he gets to the middle class. The problem is that in the US that regression is, is less than in, in other countries, so it might take a couple of generations to reach, reach there. Bruce, your chapter is mostly about the elderly, but would you have advice for the young ones too? Um, well, I'm doing other work on children. Um, and assuming that you are already upper middle class, uh, um, as Louis said, probably most the people in this room probably are, um, your child does have a good chance. Um, there's, there's a, there are a lot of issues in that question. Um, do we think of middle class as relative, in which case not everyone can be middle class or upper middle class, or do we think of it as in terms of... Uh, being able to buy a, a certain amount of goods and services, in which case possibly if average incomes rose dramatically, everyone could be. Um, the history of the, the US over the last 20, 30 years is not very positive in respect to the latter story in the sense that average incomes haven't gone up very much. Um, but yeah, predicting the future is always hard, yes. <laughs> well, I would like a, a, a have a political, oh, more. One more question, and I hope, uh, okay, go ahead. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, th this question picks up on some of that because so many people aren't born into the middle class or have a less of a chance of getting there. Given the polarization, does the work, and I'm looking at, at the first speaker, deal with the social mobility of not so much the middle class, given the implications for social stability, the political participation numbers one could see if you're looking at it from America's point of view. So the question that countervails that in some sense might be the possibility of social mobility even within the shrinking middle class from the low class up. What the alternative is non-democracy as some people have talked about. So what's the implications on the social mobility and, is any, and does the work encompass that? Oh, no, no, I just want to say you and maybe Vince, Vincent, yeah. too, I guess. Um, the, um, I mean, it's a good question, obviously, and the, you know, the answer that we, the story that we used to tell is that we, we tolerate lots of inequality because there's lots of mobility, right? Um, what do we know about um, income mobility, for instance, um, today? Well, we know that the United States is essentially in the middle of the pack. Right, that is social origins um, 
have a larger effect on destinations um, in the U.S. than in a number of other rich countries, right? So we're certainly not um, distinctively, uh, distinctively open or fluid um, country in that regard. Um, I just sort of echo what's already been said in relation to the other question, right? The, the core elasticity, right, is about 0.4. So it helps to be rich um, if you want to get your kids in the upper middle class. Um, but in terms of social mobility, um, the, the U.S. is sort of a middling case. Um, there's mobility, um, a lot of upward mobility, a lot of downward mobility as well, with what you would expect in an open system. Um, but the U.S. is not distinctively open in that regard. Thank you. On our paper, we focus on only one aspect of that broader question, and that is um, social, uh, that is mobility as a result of government redistribution. So we cover, primarily this means uh, social transfers because we don't cover all taxes, we don't cover indirect taxes, we can't using list data. So there's some other qualifications here as well. Um, the, the sort of big picture answer to that would be that um, so social uh, re redistribution by government um, does have a fairly substantial effect on um, movement across income quintile lines, and we, we have the five income quintiles. Um, but most people in all countries remain within the same income quintile before and after taxes and transfers. It's anywhere from 75% to, well, certainly over 50% in all countries. Um, of people who move, most people who move cross one quintile line. Not many people cross widely. Uh, it, that's the way government uh, redistribution programs are designed, actually. They're not designed to create huge social mobility, but only modest social mobility. Um, if I were to give sort of a bottom line to this, um, I, would, I would say that um, government redistribution has um, uh, slowed down, but not stopped, or to some degree accounted for, but not entirely uh, stopped. Um, movement towards greater income inequality has been charted in so many other uh, of, of, of the papers here. Uh, without government, income inequality would have grown more rapidly, but it hasn't entirely kept pace, which is why income inequality has grown to the extent, to the extent that, it, that it has. So that's my take on that. Well, I, I think that actually this would conclude the formal part of Q&A, but of course there will be lots of opportunity to continue that maybe more substantively much more informally, with probably some help from wine. Uh, the questions and answers would be even better. So thank you very much. Wait, and wait, there before you go, I think Chase Robinson's gonna say three words, four words. I'd like to introduce Chase Robinson, the interim president of the Graduate Center. Hell of an introduction, Janet. <laughs> Sorry. I stand between you and the reception. Um, very, very briefly, I wanted to thank all of you for coming. Um, I want to thank um, those of you who contributed. Um, I especially want to thank Marcus and Branco. Branco is not yet on the payroll. He soon will be. It is on. Um, and I look forward to engaging Branco in thorough discussions about, amongst other things, European football. Um, I'm looking for friends. Um, most of all, I want to thank Janet, and I want to do this as well, which is to say that we understand how important a resource list is. We understand the immensely important work that list does. The publication of this, uh, this terrific volume is just the most recent iteration in a whole series of accumulating pieces of evidence of the significance that it does. The Graduate Center is the research and teaching a hub of the university, and one of the ways in which we take our public mission seriously is to advance the public's understanding of issues such as this. So, I want to thank um, Janet for providing the leadership that she does. Um, I want to thank uh, members um, uh, from outside the Graduate Center, Harold Levy and others who have been so significant in, in, in helping us raise the, the visibility of, of LIS, and, and, and we look forward to to much more of it. So thank you very much. And please do help yourself. <laughs>